Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to our webinar today. My name is Virendra Sharma, and I'm a partner with Transfer Pressing Associates based out of Amsterdam. The topic for today's webinar is the Indonesian transfer pricing environment, where are we now? This topic will be taken by my colleague, Graham Garwin, who is a partner with VDB Loe in Indonesia. He has been practicing transfer pricing uh, in Indonesia for the last 18 years. Uh, before moving to VDB Loe, he was uh, leading a uh, uh, transpressing practice of KPMG in Indonesia. And uh, in, in, in 2013, he set up the tax practice of VDB Loe uh, as a regional firm focusing on legal and tax consulting. And, the, and this firm has also led, uh, he has also led the firm to recognition in ITRs, world tax and world transfer pricing. So, so as I mentioned that the topic for discussion today is Indonesian uh, transpressing environment where Graham will take you through uh, the transpressing framework in Indonesia and he will also share his practical insights uh, into uh, certain issues uh, in Indonesia in transfer pricing besides sharing his experience in the transpressing audit. Uh, before I hand over the floor to Graham, I would like to mention few important house rules. Uh, if you have any question, uh, you can text your question by checking the chat box. And uh, we will take your questions uh, two times during the presentation. One, when we are halfway through the presentation. Second time, at the end of the presentation. With this, I hand over the floor to my colleague, Graham, to take, take us through with this interesting topic of today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Verinder. Um, I understand this is a global audience, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as appropriate. Um, and respect to those in Australia who are on the night shift. Um, in today's session, I would like to firstly give you all a bit of a context with some background on Indonesia and some of the general factors to be aware of. Then I'll take you through the Indonesian transfer pricing journey up to now, highlighting some of the historical factors which have a bearing on current practice. And finally, we will look at what might be ahead and how regional and global developments play a part. So, what are we looking at? Well, I think McKinsey are able to sum up the importance and potential of Indonesia better than I can. And an oft-quoted report of 2012 begins with these current figures, current being 2010, and I'll go on about, I'll talk about that later. Uh, these, as you can see, are reasonably significant figures in their own right, with a sizable consumer class um, albeit McKinsey's definition of consumer class uh, pitches the, the bar fairly low. Um, and some fairly big opportunities. And, and note the quoted figure at the bottom only relates to specific sectors, and so the overall opportunities will be much higher. The McKinsey analysis predicts that 15 years from now, this could be the picture. Indonesia being a member of the G8 with more than 135 million members of the consuming class and opportunities, as you can see, of $1.8 trillion in those sectors alone. Just to give you an update on those figures, as I said, <clears throat> the original figures were from 2010 analysis. Um, there's no equivalent study uh, by McKinsey up to date, uh, and there's, so there's nothing in relation to the members of the consuming class or 
the population in cities producing percentages of GDP. However, the latest figures on the total GDP still ranks Indonesia as the 16th largest economy in the world. So the 2010 figures are are still basically today's figures. Uh, those those are that's based on analysis by the United Nations, the IMF, the World Bank, and the CIA. Uh, interestingly, the CIA, in terms of lowest in terms of nominal GDP, uh, has the lowest figure. Um, one wonders whether they know something that others don't. So it would look like there's not really been much progress since 2010 in terms of figures, but um, I think most people on the ground would say that there has been a reasonable amount of progress and a lot of uh, evidence of um, growth, uh, although there's a lot of political uh, and other factors uh, holding some of that back and, and probably preventing the, the potential fully fully being reached. <clears throat> So, in summary, Indonesia is the world's fourth largest country by population, the third largest democracy, and it is still a democracy despite uh, what, what you might read. Um, and it occupies a strategic position in the region that is driving global growth. Uniquely, there's a potential demographic, demographic dividend and a growing middle or consuming class. Um, but there are limiting factors uh, holding back the growth, uh, notably the continuing fight against corruption and uh, infrastructure problems. Um, and it's hoped that the new government is able to address these. Specifically in relation to today's topic, it should be noted that almost 80% of the government budget comes from the tax take, and that is from a very low level of compliance. Consistently, only 12% tax to GDP ratio, although the new government has a target to increase that to 16% within five years. And of 5 million registered corporate taxpayers, um, only 11% of those are thought to be fully compliant. Now, the result of that is that those that are compliant, and I assume from looking at the, the audience today that that means uh, most, most of, if not all of the, today's audience, uh, those that are being compliant will bear an unfair burden. Historically, tax assessments have often been without proper base and the immediate needs of the state budget have taken priority over equitable treatment. Um, it sounds like a bit of a horror story and in some cases can be, but to be fair, there are uh, there is some progress being made and there is some acknowledgement um, within the tax office that there, there needs to be a more professional and business-minded approach. There is a lot of audit activity, but as mentioned, the focus is on the compliant and not on the riskiest taxpayers. The tax authorities are keen to highlight the need for more manpower and see this as the best way to force compliance. And it should be noted that uh, a, long, a long running wish of the tax office to um, to separate itself from the Ministry of Finance would, would appear to be coming to fruition. And the, the thought is that that will allow for more flexible um, use of manpower um, and remuneration of tax, tax officials and auditors. Um, it should also be noted that the perception has been developed that foreign investors are unfairly stripping the country of profits. And this is only exacerbated by the global media focus on big name profit shifting. Indonesia is an enthusiastic supporter of the ongoing OECD BEPS project.
So what is the transfer pricing story so far? This diagram represents the normal introduction of transfer pricing to a jurisdiction. There's normally something of a beta period with feedback before any enforcement. And as you will, but as you will see in the next slide, <coughs> excuse me, um, a flurry of activity in 2009 and 2010 means that basically all of this happened at once in Indonesia, and we were left dealing with transfer pricing, transfer pricing issues on appeal before the ink was dry on documentation regulations. As you can see from this chronological list, the potential for adjustment to arms length pricing or characterization has been around for over 30 years, but there was no clear guidance explaining what was required of taxpayers. The original guidance to tax auditors was very simplistic and lacked the depth needed to ensure that proper analysis was carried out. It is important to grasp this as it has an influence on how tax auditors continue to approach transfer pricing matters. And moving back to the timeline, there was a hint of some changes in 2007 with the need to disclose related party debtors and creditors. And then changes in 2009 marked a big push. This was the first time that taxpayers were required to declare that documentation was in place to support the pricing of related party transactions. Revised guidelines to tax auditors provided some additional detail and encouraged a more robust process, but could still be interpreted as setting out a choice of limited scenarios and allowed auditors scope for arbitrary adjustments to pricing or characterization, which was not always appropriate. <clears throat> a series of benchmarks were also published with financial indicators from various industries based on inf information reported to the tax office. Um, the stated intention of, of these was to assess risk, but sometimes these indicators were used as real comparables, again without full analysis, which can obviously be very dangerous. So what happened in practice was that encouraged by prescriptive guidelines and with insufficient understanding or experience to properly analyze, auditors merely made fairly broad brushed assessments and often it was easier for them to leave decisions to the next level of appeal, meaning that tax court judges were ultimately swamped and lacked the background or training to make judgments. And often this meant there was no decision made at all. This backlog continues, meaning that there is little available precedent, although it should be noted that Indonesia runs a civil law system and therefore precedent doesn't always mean as much as it maybe should. <clears throat> Taxpayers were in many cases caught unaware, and those that had global transfer pricing documentation in place found that this was not understood. Others found that a solution imported from elsewhere did not quite fit the local story, and there was a struggle to fit round pegs into square holes, so to speak. When the story told by the documentation is unfamiliar to those in position in the country who have to explain this to tax auditors, it can be somewhat unconvincing and difficult to defend. In many cases, the fact that local executives had no power over the results nor, nor sometimes even knowledge of why charges were being levied, compounded the belief that profit shifting was happening, and nationalist tendencies came to the fore, and these continue. <clears throat> In addition, the speed of adoption meant that many issues were not taken into consideration, and there was a need to constantly revise regulations and approach. The people in charge at the tax office also changed very quickly, although it should be noted that generally speaking, those at the top were replaced by those with a slightly more business friendly approach.
some of the inconsistencies cause direct problems with other agreements, such as the original regulation on mutual agreement procedures, which contravened the terms of double tax agreements. In addition, the theoretical ability to enter into advanced pricing agreements is being pushed by the tax office. And it should be noted that they've issued another regulation in January of this year, which emphasizes that push. And entering into an advanced pricing agreement is not necessarily the route that taxpayers wish to take with certain transactions at least. It's definitely not the panacea that the tax office seems to think. So, what, what has generally been the focus? As mentioned before, in practice, audits are not risk-based, and it would be wrong to conclude that any specific industry has received more attention than others, although the resources sector is often quoted as having been targeted. <clears throat> in most industries, there are three main groups of transactions which have made up the bulk of transfer pricing adjustments. In many cases, intra-group services payments have just been ignored as tax-deductible expenses, and it's become clear that any efforts made in justifying a markup were largely wasted, as 100% of the charge is often adjusted. Efforts were and still are best directed towards justifying that the expense is genuine and has provided some form of benefit or value to the recipient of the service. In a similar way, royalty charges were often denied, and again, focus of any defence should demonstrate the benefit as well as the legal ownership of the IP and how the charge was reached. The final of these three common adjustment types is the desire of tax auditors to force a comparable uncontrolled price or transaction when proper analysis shows that large differences have not been considered or adjusted for. Overall, the number of adjustments based on a full analysis where the question comes down to interpretation or building a strong technical case are very limited. If documentation or arguments are overly technical or complex, it can be that this is seen as a smokescreen, and it's often best to keep documentation and supporting arguments as simple as possible. Telling the story as it is becomes much more credible. As mentioned, focus should be on, pr on proving that transactions exist and are of benefit. So in the case of services, supporting documentation such as reports, manuals, policies, etc., have been shown to be helpful in convincing auditors that charges are genuine. <clears throat> Evidence of activity, whether in the form of meeting minutes, third-party travel documentation, or even emails can also help. In some cases, the tax auditors cannot see past the timesheet. And note that if this type of evidence is used, contemporaneous is always good. We have seen cases where timesheets or similar evidence have been preferred, prepared as shall we say, an afterthought. And it has to be said that presenting a whole year's timesheets which contain a timestamp showing they were all printed or signed on the same day is unlikely to fool anyone. And I'm not, I'm not joking, that's a real, real life case in Indonesia at least. The best evidence is that which clearly shows a link between the activity and a specific benefit. In this case, the activity is linked to an increase in sales. Note the years here are, are not that important, um, except that the increase should be linked to the specific year of, of, uh, of the activity. Uh, it's the concept here of the link between the activity and the, and the, and the figures that have improved that is the key. 
Uh, this this would seem like a an opportune moment to to break for any questions if anyone has any at this point. No questions, Randa. Uh, sorry, guys. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's one point I would like to uh, you know would like to know your perspective. Uh, I myself have spent a couple of years in, in India in, where the TP audits have been very aggressive. Now I want to know that uh, what's the success rate of these TP audits uh, at the highest appellate level? Because my experience in India has been that. Uh, there, a lot of taxpayers, they get notice from the tax authorities uh, on many adjustments, but almost 80% of the cases are passed in favor of taxpayer when the case goes up to tribunal in India. So what's your experience in Indonesia? Hello? In, in India, that, that's actually roughly the percentage that we were looking at before the focus on transfer pricing when, when any tax cases were taken to, to appeal at the tax court. Um, generally speaking, uh, the tax court was viewed as a reasonably fair <coughs> um, tribunal system. Um, since the introduction of the, or since the focus at least on, the, on transfer pricing in, in 2009, as I mentioned, uh, there was some very, uh, very, very quick um, assessments of, of, of what were seen to be transfer pricing issues, uh, or certainly adjustments made on, on, on related party transactions, um, which, which were then appealed to tax court within within a very or within the shortest available period. Meaning that we were looking at uh, tax court cases from very early on in the what we see as the, the TP era, era in Indonesia. Unfortunately, as I, as I indicated, the, 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 the judges at tax court are on the whole very inexperienced in transfer pricing matters. And whenever there was a hint of an issue being transfer pricing related, uh, they, they, they tended to shy away, um, which meant that there was a number of, number of fairly high profile cases uh, which, as far as I understand, have yet to be concluded uh, and gone beyond the, the, the statutory limit of, of any decision being made. Um, <clears throat> I, I think there are a number of cases starting to be concluded over the last maybe a year to 18 months, but it's still unfortunately too early to really say for sure that um, we have a uh, a, a reasonable number that could be used as, as some form of, of precedent um, or, or guide. Um, and, and I think it's fairly evident given the, the push by the tax authorities for taxpayers to go into um, APAs uh, that, that they're overwhelmed um, right through the, the levels of the system right up to, to tax court. And, and they really would rather focus the attention on, on, the, on, a, on a limited number of specialists uh, within the tax office here and, and uh, in terms of dealings with other tax authorities and, and settle things through the, the APA mechanism rather than trying to make domestic decisions uh, through the normal uh, means of, um, um, of appeal. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, this next question we have is, uh, the question is, has there been any case on marketing intangible in, in Indonesia? Um, I think there's been quite a number of um, adjustments made to uh, to a number of different types of intangibles, and, you know, including marketing intangibles. I, again, I, I, I don't think that there's really a, um, a precedent or a, or a an ultimate decision that can be made on what's the uh, what's the best approach. The 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 guidelines do do mention definitions of marketing intangibles, but um, 
as I mentioned, that the key is really to to, to be able to demonstrate uh, the benefits to the to the local taxpayer um, and the ownership of the uh, of the IP and, and how the, the charge has been calculated. Um, not not always so, quite so much as a, a focus on the percentage, but um, but the mechanisms uh, and the, the um, you know whether it's a um, cost-based, income-based, or, or market-based, or, or whatever. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Just one um, one specific example, which I think kind of sums up uh, kind of approach that can be taken by by tax auditors. Uh, several years ago, we were going through a, a tax audit of a fairly well-known um, global brand, where the, the local auditors refused to believe that. The global brand had any influence on the um, on the sales in Indonesia, and believed that the, the Indonesian um, advertising and marketing efforts had had gone most of the way towards um, uh, influencing those sales. <coughs> Excuse me. They also uh, their adjustment refused to recognise that the brand, or sorry, the the royalty. Uh, was one of the differences between the, the sales to related parties and the sales to non-related parties. Uh, and their, their thinking was, and this was not so much in marketing intangibles, but their thinking was that the same technology was being applied to the, to the manufacturer of all of the, all of the product, uh, and therefore that was not a difference, regardless of whether it was being charged or not. The, the, kind, of, the kind of arguments that that can come up from the from the tax authorities. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, the next question we have is: uh, Is the taxpayer in Indonesia required to maintain contemporaneous documentation, and what penalties are there for non-maintenance of documentation? <clears throat> okay. Um, well, the, there's no specific. Um, Penalty applied. There, there is a on the annual tax return, annual corporate tax return. Uh, there's a declaration to be made saying that uh, documentation is in place, um, and uh, it, it's it's reasonably detailed um, disclosure of the the methodologies uh, being applied and the reasons for applying methodologies. Um, so so that you have to de declare that you do have the documentation in place. And then, if you are subjected to a tax audit, uh, you only have seven days in which to produce that documentation and more. The tax audit guidelines for transfer pricing include uh, some documentation which is not uh, does not form part of a standard set of uh, transfer pricing documentation. <clears throat> we'll go into a little bit of detail on that uh, in the next slides. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and the last question we have is, uh, do we have any safe harbor rule in Indonesia? Uh, so far, no. Um, and it's it, 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 the common question in a lot of seminars or presentations is, um, you know, very, very standard, uh, is, is this percentage or is that percentage okay for our business? And, and as, as most of the audience have probably reasonably familiar with, with transfer pricing will know that that's an extremely difficult um, question to answer and danger, dangerous question to, <laughs> to answer without full knowledge of, the, uh, of all of the facts. Um, but so far there's no, there's no safe harbor, so to speak, uh, in, in the same way as there would be in perhaps, you know, for example, in Singapore or, or other jurisdictions in terms of you know, services or whatever. But, but Graham, in that case, what should be the right uh, risk mitigation strategy for the taxpayer in, in, in Indonesia? Is it like maintaining the, uh, a very detailed documentation or look for APAs or something else? Um, well, I think for, for transactions, it, it would seem that the, the wish of the tax authorities is that, um, is that taxpayers do go for APAs. Um, as far as I'm aware, none have yet been concluded uh, in Indonesia. Um, 
and and only a, only a, probably a handful have actually been uh, gone through the, further than the initial stages. <clears throat> um, but there is a there is a drive for the, by the tax authorities to encourage uh, APAs. Uh, I think in terms of most transactions, which probably don't justify uh, going into a specific APA, uh, the key, uh, as I as I mentioned, is is probably to Start from a very simple basis and make sure that your documentation tells the real story. It's not it's not just some sort of template that's been used uh, across the world and might not particularly relate to to Indonesia. Um, I think there's a, a, a there has been a tendency, uh, certainly in the initial stages, when people were were panicking to get some form of documentation in place to to an extent use kind of off the shelf type products um, and. That's all very well if it if it matches the rea reality of the situation. But what we found was that you end up with with local um, staff or people trying to trying to justify the position to tax auditors when it was not really familiar to them as being the day to day reality of their their business. Okay, uh, uh, Graham, I've received two more questions. I'll quickly uh, uh, share those questions with you. The okay. one question we have is which which is the preferred database for selection of comparable companies in Indonesia? Right. Um, well, the tax office have gone on public record as saying that they will uh, they will not uh, specifically favour any particular database, and um, they they look at not only the, uh, the commercial databases being touted by by various um, organisations, but also Information available in the public domain on on the internet, etc. Um, they themselves, um, I believe, still use um, Osiris and Oriana, but um, that's largely due to uh, uh, marketing by the uh, company that pushes those. Okay. Um, but I, I think, uh, that they, as I say, they've they've not um, they've not they've specifically said that they don't they won't favour one or the other. Uh, the key would be more in the in the in the methodology used in in selecting your your, your comparables. Okay. Uh, the next question I have is: How will the local tax authorities assert uh, location savings and lo local marketing intangibles? Mm. Sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, the question is that how the local uh, transfer pricing authorities in Indonesia they look at location savings and local marketing intangible issue. Right. Um, well, in terms of location savings, um, I, I don't. I don't think they've specifically said anything. Certainly not in the public domain. Maybe in some specific um, uh, cases. But they haven't um, they haven't come out, for example, in the same way as the Indian authorities, and, and suggested that there should be a you know a much higher markup because of the location savings. Um, but uh, in terms of the local um, marketing intangibles, I think the example I went through before, um, they, they, they tended to 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 be of the opinion that that local uh, Local efforts had been um, much more um, had much more of an influence on the results locally than than was being recognised in the in the splits of profits or the pricing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So, Graham, we could continue with your uh, presentation. Okay. Um, well, the next the next few slides set out uh, the current tax office thinking. Uh, and this is taken from one of their recent presentations. Um, I just want to take you through their views and provide some commentary. <clears throat> oh, the, the stated purpose and, and focus of a specific transfer pricing audit um, would seem to be clear enough. Uh, but the, the theory uh, is that this has been based on some form of risk analysis. Um, uh, and the, the, the reasons given for uh, triggering a tax uh, transfer pricing audit based on such risk analysis would 
would seem to be reasonably valid as well. But in reality, as we've stated before, uh, you know, this is this is rarely the case. Uh, the, the highest the highest risk transactions are not necessarily the ones that are being uh, focused on, and uh, part, partly that is uh, the, the low level of compliance and, and the fact that the, the foreign investment companies are, are, are fairly principal targets. Um, in terms of, of documentation, uh, specific issues which the tax office have noted uh, include a lack of disclosure in the annual tax return, um, documentation prepared um, after the fact. Uh, here they've said it should be cont contemporaneous, but um, uh, there's no specific, apart from the, the disclosure that, that it is in place, there's no specific penalty or no specific mention of contemporaneous in any of the regulations. Um, they've also mentioned this, this third bullet point here is the additional information that's requested in the context of a tax audit, which must be provided within seven days. Um, <clears throat> and they've also mentioned that they, they see a problem with the lack of information um, on the, the foreign affiliates and how they fit into the value chain. And in terms of, of technical issues or problems which the tax office cite, um, what the one major one is the lack of uh, connection between the, the documentation covering how the industry performs compared to the taxpayer in question. Um, and I, this is a, a bit of a symptom of, as I mentioned before, the kind of off-the-shelf approach which the taxpayers and their advisors uh, were certainly using in the early days. And, perhaps still to an extent are where you know that the requirement for an industry analysis is just seen as a, a tick the box um, issue and sometimes it's not very consistent with the reality of what's happened to the to the taxpayer <clears throat> and there's no real consideration given to, 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 the, to the, the consistency of what, what we're saying and what's really happened <clears throat> And, and quite often, as I, I mentioned, the, the, the people to whom the, the tax office are, are allowed to speak, um, and sometimes even those preparing the report, um, are not really those who know fully how the important functions operate. <clears throat> and the thinking is that if the documentation is consistent with the facts, then it shouldn't be a problem to explain to the tax, tax office officers um, and it's, it's worth considering the implications of that. Uh, in theory, the, the tested party in any benchmarking exercise should be the one which performs the least complex or unique function, um, as this is likely to be the easiest to compare to third party or market arrangements. Uh, and the tax office often complains that they are not made aware of enough information regarding affiliates uh, to, to determine which is the, the least uh, complex uh, function. Uh, it's not clear you know, what exactly they would want to do with such information. You know, for example, if if the analysis showed that the local entity was not the the, the most uh, the simplest or the least complex, you know, would would they expect to see uh, the the benchmarking analysis from the other side? They've, they've not made that the most uh, made that all, uh, all, altogether clear. <clears throat> Um, now, one of the requirements within the additional detail, which is required in the context of a transfer pricing audit, is that accounting information is, is segmented to show the results of the specific related party transaction. Many taxpayers will contest that their systems are not set up to cater for this level of detail, but, but the tax office has, has basically come out with a view that they've seen it from some taxpayers and therefore it's expected from all. Um, I, I guess in some ways the, the global changes which will be brought about by the, the BEPS project um, might lead to similar changes in financial reporting requirements 
and I wonder whether in this respect the Indonesian authorities are ahead of the curve. <clears throat> um, they've also cited issues with comparables. You know, how comparable are they? Are they? Um, and the same complaint could certainly be made about some of their own analysis when they're uh, when they're coming up with uh, an adjustment, or, or lack lack of analysis might be a better way of putting that. They've they've also got issues regarding whether a number of years are compared at a time. And verbally, they've indicated that a three-year average is appropriate, but nothing is as yet regulated. And uh, there's no mention of whether industry differences uh, will be taken into account. You know, certain, certainly, there are some industries, for example, insurance, uh, where a three-year uh, um, average is certainly not near, nearly long enough. <coughs> And finally, the, the issue which I highlighted earlier with regard to intra-group services and royalties. Uh, the tax office often cite lack of information or insufficient arguments that the services have been provided or, or have been of benefit to the local entity. <clears throat> and they may challenge the underlying cost base or the means by which this has been allocated. Um, if you can be in a position to support such charges at the earliest stage in any tax or that it has been shown to be critical in, in mitigating the chances of any assessment. You know, we've, we've, we've had a number of cases where uh, having that kind of information to hand locally or support from the head office or regional office at a, a, in a timely manner um, has helped enormously um, in fending off some of these type of adjustments. <coughs> Uh, suggestions from the tax office with regard to dealing with transfer pricing audits, um, including uh, involvement, active, active, active engagement in the preparation of documentation. Um, and I, I mean, this is kind of repeating the issue from before. It's quite often the case that taxpayers don't understand their own documentation or even don't understand the charges that they're receiving from their affiliates. And it's critical that this is addressed um, again, partly this can be done by keeping documentation simple, but also being very consistent with the actual business. <clears throat> Where losses have occurred, um, these will often be questioned. I'm sure that's no surprise. Um, and, but they should be accepted. And again, they've gone on record as saying they should be accepted provided there's commercial justification and support. Uh, just to contrast that, if the if the documentation states that all risk is borne by an overseas affiliate, it will be very difficult for the tax office to accept that a local taxpayer should suffer any losses. Any transactions with affiliates in, in low tax countries or tax havens are likely to be viewed with uh, suspicion and, and must be uh, fully justified. Um, and finally, they, they've made what might be called a peace offering uh, saying that both sides in the tax transfer pricing audit should adhere to the good faith approach, which is mentioned in the OECD guidelines. <clears throat> so, what, what do we think comes next, and, and, and do we see any trends or influences from, from outside? <clears throat> well, we understand that further changes or additions to the current regulations uh, may be issued in 2015. They, they were planned to be issued, uh, I believe, initially in 2013. Um, whether they will continue with, uh, with, with those plans or not is, is unclear. And it's also unclear whether these will include, um, uh, sorry, what these will include. But it's highly likely uh, that the trend will be towards greater disclosure. And, and the burden on taxpayers will increase. Um, it, it's hoped that any changes will be in line with or complement those which arise from the, the BEPS project and therefore won't be too inconsistent with what is being done you know, on, a, on a global or a regional basis. Um, and, and as an enthusiastic participant in this process, um, it's likely that Indonesia will try to adopt the new measures 
at the earliest stage, and some of these can be as evident or evident already. Um, un unfortunately, not not always with full um, understanding of of the implications or or, or the uh, everything that lies behind it. Um, you know, for example, the need to attribute for profits by function uh, aligns somewhat with the overall aim of BEPS, and in some ways mirrors the country by country reporting requirements. The importance of tax collection to the national economy and the pressure caused by the low level of compliance uh, will continue to mean that foreign investors uh, who, who take the, generally take the compliant approach uh, will, will continue to be subject to scrutiny and, and they must therefore prepare accordingly. <clears throat> um, there's a number of programs in place to learn from other tax authorities and institutions um, I've been involved in talks with advisors from an Australian funded project, uh, with advisors from the IMF and with the ADB, and all see similar problems, um, but acknowledge that some progress uh, has occurred and there is a desire to change, although it's a fairly slow process and some have noted that the same problems were pointed out in 1998 when uh, they came in to assist with the uh, financial crisis. It's, it's difficult to see that any of the upcoming changes in the ASEAN area are being considered in any, in any kind of concerted way. Um, and in fact, some commentators are warning that certain of the policy moves may place Indonesia at a disadvantage uh, when, the, when the free, free trade area um, comes to fruition. Um, so o overall, um, a large part of the pressure on collection will be relieved if the new government can achieve their stated aim of increasing the tax to GDP ratio uh, to 16%. It's hoped that this will leave compliant taxpayers more certain in their positions and less vulnerable to time consuming and costly dispute resolution processes. <laughs> so, in, in conclusion, um, the importance of Indonesia and in the global economy and the opportunities it presents cannot be ignored, but investors must appreciate the unique, unique challenges that must be faced. The importance of tax collection and the low levels of compliance means that those that are compliant, especially multinationals and foreign investors, have to share a higher proportion of the burden, and effective tax rates are often higher than anticipated. <clears throat> um, an understanding of what specific local documentation is required and how to present that to the tax office is critical, um, and it should be noted that adjustments are still being made without a full analysis or justification, and being able to head these off with a clear, with clear, simple documentation which tells the real story can only help in avoiding, avoiding these adjustments. <clears throat> Early adoption of the global changes being brought about by the BEPS project uh, is, is fairly likely. So oh, many thanks for your attention. I think we hopefully should have some more time for, for Q&A. If there's any further questions. Uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, 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 we have a few questions here now. Uh, the first question we have is, uh, do tax authorities in Indonesia, they accept foreign comparables as well as regional comparables? Um, do they accept foreign comparables? What was the last bit of the... And regional comparables. Right. Um, well, basically, they, they have to because there's a complete lack of, um, of Indonesian data. And so the, the general approach is to try and, and use uh, pan-Asian pan comparables in most circumstances, um, possibly with the except, you know, excluding the likes of uh, Japan and Korea, uh, maybe, maybe even Singapore if the... Depending on the on the type of transaction, if uh, these comparables are not thought to be um, well, they're not thought to be comparable uh, because of the different uh, levels of the economies. Okay. Uh, the next is uh, which uh, transfer pricing method is used uh, in in Indonesia? Is it CAP or transition net margin method or any other method which is mostly used? Right. Um, 
I think the initial um, the initial flurry of activity was was always to uh, to try and follow the the TNMM. This is on on the part of taxpayers and their advisors. Um, the initial response to the uh, from the tax authorities was that that was very much um, a method of last resort, and they didn't they didn't favour TNMM at all. They were all, they were very um, keen to try and force cups wherever they could. Um, that their position has mellowed somewhat. And the, the, the the latest um, regulations say that um, the, the most uh, the most appropriate method should be used. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, there are still cases where they will try and force cups where they're not there. There is no there is no cup or there's no appropriate cup. Um, uh, and TNMM, although it's uh, not quite the um, as dirty a, a word as it used to be, um, I think is only really likely to be fully accepted if if it's a fully segmented approach, and the TNMM is is just on on that particular transaction, um, which I think is possibly almost Im impossible to to do. But um, maybe somebody can prove me wrong. Okay, thank you, uh, Graham. I will read another question for you, and the question is. Can you elaborate more on how Indonesian tax authorities analyze intangibles uh, like the characterization between services and royalties? How do they analyze intangibles in terms of the characterization between services and royalty? Yes, I think the, the question here is that's how the tax authorities look at services would they classify that as, that as intangible in certain situations in terms of you know looking from uh, from them as royalty payments? All right. Okay. Um, I think that my my initial re response to that would be that uh, it probably harks back to more of the the kind of approach that they were taking before the focus on transfer pricing, where um, the, the the, the use of any terms such as management fees uh, were, were often seen as either either royalties or disguised dividends um, on the premise that the Indonesian tax authorities felt that management should be local and there, there shouldn't be any need for payments to overseas. Uh, they, they've mellowed somewhat on that and they do accept that certain certain activities are, are centralized and there is a, there is a you know, with the globalization, there is a need to uh, to try and, as I say, centralize certain services and and, and recharge them. Um, so, to the extent that there is um, evidence that actual activity has taken place, then uh, it's fairly. I think it's fairly unlikely they would try and specifically characterize the payment as a royalty. Um, but having you know, having said that, as I mentioned. It's very important to be able to to show that what what the service was, how it benefited the, the local entity, um, <clears throat> before you even get round to, to to calculating how the how the charge was was um, made. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question we have, Graham, is how the Indonesian tax authorities they are looking at country by country reporting by the OCD. Um, well, as I said, I think the Indonesian authorities are likely to be fairly, fairly early adopters of most of the um, most of the uh, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me most of the pronouncements from the OECD or the, the decisions made in terms of these uh, various projects. Um, in terms of country by country, I, I think uh, it will depend on um, it will depend on how the uh, it's, it's not, not yet clear how the, the the proposals are being are being received uh, in Indonesia or or how they're uh, looking at the the early adopters and have you know people who are going to a, a um, <clears throat> excuse me 
starting to lose my voice. <laughs> um, the, um, yeah, as I say, country to by country, it's 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 very early days at the moment. But I think uh, the the fact that they've shown they've shown the desire to see segmentation uh, and and analysis at that kind of level, it, it's it's likely. And, and as I mentioned before, that their, their desire to see how the the foreign affiliates fit into the the value chain, um, I, I think they're, they're fairly likely to be. Um, very, very ag aggressive adopters of, of any of the kind of uh, suggestions. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is: uh, Is is there uh, is it correct to say that no penalty on non-compliance uh, on documentation maintenance, and uh, uh, is there any safe harbor rule for documentation exemption? All right. Okay. Um, well, there's no specific penalty on non-compliance with documentation, but what you will find is if you don't have the documentation in place um, and they come in to scrutinise, then you're you're very much on the back foot, and uh, you you are expected to um, to be able to produce uh, the transfer of pricing documentation plus some additional information in a very short space of time. Um, in terms of an exemption, there, there is a, a limit that anything less than 10 billion rupiah, which is now around seven, between 70 and 800,000 US dollars. Um, this does not specifically require documentation, uh, but there's no, there's no Corresponding exemption, which which says that the tax authorities cannot make an adjustment on such transactions. So it's very much a commercial decision as to what what the level of risk is for these lower lower types of uh, uh, values of transactions, and whether uh, you need to maintain or what level of documentation you need to maintain in relation to those. But that that, that limit, that, that ten billion rupiah, so it's so let's say eight hundred thousand dollars to be safe. Um, <clears throat> that that applies to one particular, you know, any particular affiliate. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, Graham, next question, I think you already addressed during the presentation, but I'm uh, sharing this question with you so that you can share your perspective again. Uh, the question is that, uh, are there any APAs signed? And if yes, whether they are unilateral or bilateral? Right. There's, there's, as far as I'm aware, there's, there's no APAs signed, even, even unilateral ones, uh, as of now. Certainly, that was the case about six to eight weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> so I don't, I don't believe there's any that have been concluded yet. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is that uh, I'll read that question for you uh, from the audience. Uh, I noticed that on page 10 of the slides, uh, there are certain revisions to TP documentation guidance in 2011, uh, which which post some documentation requirements and minimum threshold. Can you further elaborate on that? I think the question here is that, uh, you know, uh, in 2011, you know, there are certain revisions happened. And uh, there were some documentation requirements and some minimum threshold. Uh, can you elaborate on on this point? Okay, I think. I mean, I think that goes back to what I've, the the one the previous question that the the minimum threshold are <clears throat> of ten ten billion uh, rupiah in the previous uh, round of, of of regulations. The the minimum threshold was ten million rupiah, which is uh, you know, minuscule amount of money in today's well, eight hundred dollars or so, um, but that was that was up to ten billion, so, so, so roughly eight hundred thousand um, dollars, and that means that um, for for levels of transactions with particular affiliates that are below that threshold, there's no specific requirement to maintain documentation which you could you tick all the boxes saying you have various 
um, elements of, of the documentation or support in place. Uh, but as I mentioned, um, there's still the ability for them to make an adjustment to these kind of transactions. And so it's a commercial decision to what extent you want to keep uh, levels of support for these. Okay, thank you. Uh, Graham, next I have is what is the total adjustments proposed by the tax authorities in recent years of audits? What was the total adjustment? Yeah. Uh, that that <laughs> sort of information is not publicly available. I have no no idea really. It'd be fairly significant, but I, I've got no idea how to, how it would be quantified. Uh, but uh, from one question I will have on this is Graham, do you do you see that uh, are these adjustments they increasing uh, year on year or you know there is no trend there is no emerging trend on these adjustments? Um, I certainly don't think there's any sign of them decreasing. Um, as I say, it's, it's difficult to difficult to know for sure because the, the information is not publicly available. But given that the tax budget um, is increasing uh, year on year uh, and is never is never quite met, um, I suspect that the, the level of adjustments uh, on related party transactions is also uh, increasing in efforts to, to meet these budgets. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. Uh, so we we have covered all questions, and uh, uh, with this, I thank you for uh, taking a presentation on this important topic, uh, and I thank the audience for their participation. Uh, before closing this pre presentation, I would like to mention that this the recorded version of this presentation will be available within weeks' time now. And uh, so you can access it if you would like to hear this presentation again. So thanks, everyone, and we look forward to having another webinar another time. Thank you.